Okay, I'm going to get started. Uh, this talk is about 20 minutes. And I want to start by saying, uh, how many people here have seen the rise of the planet of the apes? Just started, I saw it on Friday. Um, if you find the idea of neurogenesis, hello, uh, through viruses, bioengineered viruses, you might want to read this book. It's called Viralution um, by Frank Ryan. And uh, I think that there are many things from science fiction that become reality. Now, this talk is focused on the positive things, the, the things that are more constructive, though science fiction actually has both a self-fulfilling and a self-preventing prophecy uh, aspect to it. Okay, so I have to... Please join us. Come over, you'll like it. You'll get ideas. Oh, crap. Yes. Okay, good. All right, here we go. Okay, next slide, please. So, what use is science fiction? Oh, sorry, can you go back one? I realize some people don't know who I am. I'm Alex Lightman. I'm the author of the first book on 4G, Brave New Unwired World, The Digital Big Bang and the Infinite Internet. Um, the whole world voted uh, with The Economist magazine on the innovation that almost radically changed the world over the next decade. They started with 4,000 uh, suggestions, 32 judges boil it down to seven, uh, and I won. So I have the innovation that The Economist reader said would be the most influential in the next decade. Hopefully, that gives you a reason to listen to this. Also, I wrote a book called it's Reconciliation, 78 Reasons to End the U.S. Embargo of Cuba, and I posted on Facebook this morning that if the U.S. has one of the best credit ratings in the world, and it has this kind of structure, and Cuba has that, another kind of structure, and the worst credit rating, they're going to go up and we're going to go down. So if you want to know more about that, you can check out the work. Okay, next slide, please. What use is science fiction? Well, Albert Einstein said, famously, imagination is more important than knowledge. I posted that on Facebook once with a giant rebuttal, and I got like 50 people saying that they like the quote. I don't think people have really thought it through that much. Um, imagination actually is more important than, uh, I mean, knowledge is more important than imagination. But there are certain kinds of imagination which are ridiculously important, and that is maybe 10% of science fiction turns out to have shaped the world as much as everything from religion and everything from politics and everything from war combined. So, New York Times said, science fiction was started on the edges of literature and pulp fiction has become more than mainstream. It's now an essential way of interpreting the world. Part of the reason that so many people here, nobody here has touched the sun. We can't smell it, we can't taste it, but we have a really strong sense. I bet that most of the people collectively in this room, we could write a book about the sun. How do we know so much? Well, because we got interested and we looked into it. Part of the reason is because of science fiction. Uh, George Orwell said in 1984, which is written in 1948, we control matter because we control the mind. Reality is inside the skull. And uh, one of my alma maters is MIT. And MIT shamelessly uses science fiction all the time to rake in the big bucks for contracts. And more than half the people here, my sense is, are looking for money. So I think writing science fiction is an essential skill to getting funding for space. That's why this talk is useful to you. Imagine the psychological impact upon a foe when encountering squads of seemingly invincible warriors protected by armors and endowed with superhuman capabilities, such as the ability to leap over 20-foot walls. That got a $50 million contract from the Army for MIT. It's just pure 100% science fiction by my definition, which I'll give you in a second. And they, got, they spent all that money and they got a renewed grant again and they got more people. Next slide, please. So science fiction to me is a natural resource even more valuable than oil, even more valuable than gold. So for instance, Jules Verne said or more than a century ago, he envisioned a submarine run on electric batteries and a rocket to the moon launched from near Cape Canaveral by Americans, directly inspiring what led to the first nuclear submarine, the Nautilus, and to the Apollo space program. H.G. Wells directly inspired the battle tank, air forces, atomic bomb, future studies, and also another thing that's kind of funny, uh, which uh, the last company to win 
a prize from NASA's Office of the Chief Technologist. I went after the talk yesterday and went, looked it up. Uh, it's called Laser Motive. And they were uh, entering this NASA's Space Elevator contest. And we'll talk about that. Who came up with the, who, who made the first big fictional realization of the Space Elevator? Clark. Yes, in what? Uh, in Fountains of Paradise. Oh, is it in Fountains of Paradise? Yes. Oh, okay, because it's also in 3001. And it's like a, a whole few chapters of the book. So, um, but the laser, he can't, uh, the la anyone know which novel that H.G. Wells it came up and invented the laser, directed energy? Uh, War of the Worlds, 1898. The military read that and said, oh, well, if aliens come here, we better have one of those to counteract it. Um, and according to Corso's book, the guy who's an actual military officer, in the day after tomorrow, the laser is one of four Div uh, technologies we got from the Roswell crash. Anyone know what the other ones? I consider that science fiction, by the way. Uh, fiber optics, yes, good. Anyone else? Um, not directly, but the laser, fiber optics, uh, semiconductors, and night vision. He claimed they all came there, and he gives very elaborate details about how they all entered into the technology stream. Uh, and future studies. H.G. Wells is credited with inventing future studies, which to me is a place where science fiction and business planning and politics all overlap. Uh, so H.G. Wells, conversing with his nemesis, Henry James, who completely burned his social standing and the social networks of the day in the 1910s, said, to you, literature is an end. To me, literature, like architecture, is a means. It has a use. Next slide. So space power. There's a science fiction panopticon after Sputnik. If you want to know why was there so much funding for space, this is the reason. Robert Heinlein and Captain Landing, U.S. Navy, so some people don't know, they think, oh yeah, Heinlein was a military writer. Heinlein co-authored a lot of his work with military people, just like Tom Clancy actually was writing from the Navy. In other words, the Navy would do a lot of Tom, Tom Clancy's writing for him to get out certain kinds of psychological preparation for battle plans. Like Hunt for Red October, it was basically sending out the signal to the Soviets, oh, by the way, you better not have any autonomy for your submarine commanders. They'll just come over and here's exactly a blueprint of how to get your sub to us. So once developed, space travel can and will be the source. Notice he says space travel. Can and will be the source of supreme, not just any kind of power, but supreme military power over the planet and over the entire solar system. There's literally no way to strike back from the ground, sea, or air at a spaceship, whereas a spaceship armed with atomic weapons can wipe out anything at the globe. Boom! There's a huge amount of money ready to go for space. And then it took Lyndon B. Johnson, and look at that, 1958, when he was a senator, saying control of space means control of the world. That's why Johnson put so much money into space, and that's why, as far as I know, the biggest single space management complex is Johnson Space Center. Next slide. So science fiction actually is America's edge. I'm writing a paper for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy now, and I actually told the White House we are going to get a downgrade. I said this before it happened. I told this the Saudi Arabians hired me three years ago to tell them what to do, and I told them the U.S. would lose if get downgraded this year. So my credibility with them is 100%. <laughs> and it just happened Friday. <laughs> um, Science fiction is America's core competency. Now you may go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Lots of people have science fiction. I'll give you a stat that will knock your socks off. If you look at the highest grosses of the 300 biggest grossing movies of all time, over 95% of them are American and they're science fiction, if you use my definition of science fiction. 95%. Keep in mind, Americans are only 4.5% of the world. There's nothing, nothing in the world that's been around for 100 years that any nation dominates like we dominate science fiction in the movies. So what did Clark come up with? Geosynchronous satellites. Has anyone here not heard that before? Two, three people. Okay, were you guys born in America? No, you were. Okay, great. You weren't? Okay. This is something that, that sort of people take for granted, but it's really special. Geosynchronous satellites are really, really important. Satellite television, porn channels, but I think what's amazing is the impact of watching porn from satellite TV on reduced productivity. <laughs> he has a story in which the Soviet Union's dastardly plot to make the United States growth rate go from 5% down to about 1% or so, or below 1%, you ready for this? Is to go and do videotape and put it up of Kujarao temples. 
Kudra Temple is where it is in India. Anyone heard of this? It's basically the whole temples are covered with little tiny 3D relief of people having sex in every position imaginable. They're actually pretty cool. And he said, if we could get porn out so Americans could watch it, their productivity would go down to no. Now, who thinks he was wrong about that? <laughs> One person? Do you know what America's first quarter growth rate was? It was 0.4%. Do you know what the stats are for people watching YouTube at work? I mean, it's crazy. He was right about that. Also, he invented the waterbed, which goes with the porn and the channels and everything else. He was a full service writer. And then look at, came out of 2001. He sort of owned that year, 2010 and 3000. The big thing in the world is the space elevator. Okay, Heinlein. Heinlein had a lot of things, but this is the one I think that is, it gives me chills because the guy that I'm working for at the White House came up with the National Nanotechnology Initiative, which is putting $10 billion a year in funding to nanotech. Where did nanotech come from? It came from a novella called Waldo an exoskeleton, remote manipulation with Waldos, each building smaller Waldos, like Matryoshka dolls. You know how the Russian dolls, you pull one out, one out, one out. Well, basically, you make machines that are smaller, that they make machines that are smaller. And that was directly the inspiration for Richard Feynman's There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, which is credited, along with K. Eric Drexler's uh, Engines of Creation, with the start of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology originated 100% as science fiction. All, everything in nanotechnology at the beginning was basically chemistry plus science fiction equals funding. Next slide. The medium that transmutes the future. Science fiction is the medium which our, in which our miserable certainty that tomorrow will be different from today's in ways we can't predict can be transmuted to a sense of excitement and anticipation, occasionally evolving into awe. Like, I felt kind of awe when the guy who works here at the museum was giving his T-5 talk, like, oh, here's where we could go. Yes, that's science fiction to me. Poised between intransigent skepticism and uncritical credulity, it is, the par ex it is par excellence the literature of the open mind, according to John Brunner. Anybody know what John Brunner invented in science fiction? The worm. The, the basically, the worm that goes over and, re and pills up, fills, uh, pulls documents out and puts them out for the public. He had that in the shockwave rider, and the first worm... The guy who wrote it, they said, why did you do it? He said, oh, I read the shockwave rider, and I wanted to be that guy. <laughs> Next slide. By the way, cyber war is now a, an actual, real, live, Pentagon-focused cyber area. He basically created an entire enemy out of cyberspace. And who here knows who coined the term cyberspace? Uh, no, nope, before him. <laughs> Anybody? William Gibson in Neuromancer. Yeah. Oh, did you say that? No, I was trying to think what the name of the book was. Oh, did you think we've already, uh, we're on a telepathic basis? <laughs> How exciting. Okay, this is my buddy, Marty Cooper. Now, yesterday I was thrilled that people came up. Three different people came up with Walt Disney. He aired three television shows with Werner von Braun, who was an ex-Nazi, for God's sake. It's not an obvious connection between Walt Disney and, you know, an ex-Nazi. On an entertainment show and that showed manned missions to the moon and Mars. And also, this is really critical. He made Tomorrowland. Now, Tomorrowland could have been about agriculture. Like, if you've seen The Land at Epcot, you could have a hundred different things to talk about the future. Disney did something powerful. He defined the future as space. You want the future, the better future? Space. Clean, white, beautiful design space. Like, why are our spaceships white? Because Tomorrowland was white. Why, are, why is Steve Jobs, all these things with Apple, this aesthetic of white, this bronze, also bronze, not, no relation to Werner von Braun, but it's all that white aesthetic of space. That white blank canvas to paint a new future on. Also, Marty Cooper, who told me this directly, and he watched Star Trek, and inspired Martin Cooper at Motorola to make in 1973 the first private handheld mobile phone. Now, how do I know it's related to science fiction? Because it was called the Star Trek. <laughs> And then Paramount, idiotically, insanely, uh, said, well, we don't want you to call it that. That, that looks ugly. That's, that's big and bulky, and ours are small and svelte. And he said, so they called it the Star Trek. Paramount complained. So they started to call it Star Trek. Paramount complained. So they called it the Dynatac for dynamic, adaptive, total coverage. They're like basically re semantically retreating. But why doesn't science fiction get credit? Because people complain. I'll give you another example which you may have heard of. 
when the Strategic Defense Initiative was announced under Ronald Reagan, a critic who has attacked me for being the strutting voice of American space macho, I find that extremely amusing, um, because I, I wrote this article on US should own space, uh, moon, Mars, all stuff like that for Space Governance Magazine. Um, he coined the term Star Wars, and the US government loved it. And so they actually started putting in classified official documents, Star Wars as the name, the official name of the program, until George Lucas sued the US government for using his name Star Wars. Look, that's not even how trademarks work. It's like a real thing. Well, but he said, actually, well, it's not a real thing, so until it's not a real thing, then you're violating my trademark. <laughs> so, um, and basically that first phone was about $8,000. The pad from Star Trek also inspired the Palm Pilot and Newton leading to the iPhone and the iPad today. This is admitted. Next slide. Science fiction is misunderstood. It's an, um, and here I'm about to give a, a one minute rant about the words and why we need a new definition of science fiction. It's an awkward way of saying something isn't actual, real, authentic, or true. It's science, not science fiction. Ah, that makes me so annoyed. And it's a misnomer from Hugo Gernsbach, who made, was sort of the captain of, of, uh, of Pulp Fiction and created, they coined the term science fiction. It wasn't called science fiction H.G. Wells and Jules Verne's day. Science fiction authors used to be world famous and consults with head of state before Hugo Gernsbach coined the term. But H.G. Wells screwed this up by picking fights with both Henry James and J.P. Morgan, which meant picking fights with the whole community around literature and business. Next slide. So don't do that. Um, <laughs> Also, science uh, fiction was formerly, I think you're gonna love this distinction, formerly when people were writing, like Mary Shelley, anyone know how old Mary Shelley was when she wrote Frankenstein? 18, who said that? Yes, we have a very literate audience. Well done. Scientists talk about a priori knowledge. Who's heard that term before? Okay, basically knowledge that comes before experiment and experience. For instance, Jules Verne on what the moon's surface is like. That's a priori knowledge. And a posteriori knowledge, knowledge that comes after repeated experiments or experiment, astronaut Neil Armstrong on what the moon's surface is like. There's a qualitative, quantitative, measurable difference in the regolith and everything else. We have many more words for it. So science fiction used to be nearly 100% a priori, making wild guesses about hundreds of things, many of them laughably wrong, but some of them still amazingly, just by sheer fluke on target. Next slide. But now it's supercharged with a posteriori knowledge. Um, in 2009, actually, this is an updated slide, I should have done it, 2011, we have the benefit of tens of millions of man years and trillions of dollars. I repeat, trillions of dollars. We spent a trillion dollars just on the space launch facilities in the United States alone. I kid you not, that's a direct quote from the Air Force. Worth of scientific and industrial research to draw on. So, so many serious scientists have taken to writing science fiction themselves or to collaborating or consulting on manuscripts to maintain accuracy in scientific details, including, but not limited to Stephen Hawking, Gregory Bentford, etc., that today's science fiction, I love this phrase, is thoroughly penetrated by a hard-won a posteriori knowledge. It's a different quality. It's just like you have a composite material, like you turn iron in, or into steel. Next slide. So most of the definitions of science fiction are utterly, completely useless. And they're, I, I, they, they annoy me just to see them. Science fiction is what we point to when we say it. Thank you, Damon Knight, for nothing. Science fiction is a genre of fiction. Gee, Wikipedia, wow, the collective wisdom of mankind really outdid itself. You, you don't know what it is, but you know it when you see it. Oh, wow, what an improvement on Damon Knight. Uh, Rod Serling, fantasy is the impossible made probable. Science fiction is the improbable made possible. Okay. Uh, less useless but not memorable. Realistic speculation about possible future events based solidly on adequate knowledge of the real world, past and present, and a thorough understanding of the nature and significance of the scientific method. Okay, but it's still kind of dull, even for Robert Heinlein. Next slide. My definition of science fiction, visions of technology that people will pay for, which brings us back to the money. So here's something from The Dying Earth um, by Jack Vance, who makes the point we get what we pay for. I respond to three questions, say the auger. For 20 tercies, I phrase the answer in clear and actionable language. Blueprint. For 10, I use the language of Kant, which occasionally admits of ambiguity. For five, I speak a parable, which you must interpret as you will, as people do on Sunday at the, when they go to church. And for one tercy, I babble in an unknown tongue. Blah, 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 and stuff. That's what you get. If you, what basically you just heard, if you heard that first talk on the cradle of aerospace, what's been created here within a three mile radius of here 
is science fiction that people paid a billion tercies for. They paid for it and they got real science fiction. Science fiction is that thing, the more you pay, the more reality you get. Next slide. My definition of science fiction, visions of technology people will pay for. Every novum or new cool thing creates a goal for a new self-organizing tribe of people. For instance, a classic thing for me is, who has heard of transparent aluminum? It was one little three-minute segment. It's a couple of lines in a script of Star Trek IV, the Save the Whales one, right? It was something that they traded to get a lot of the plexiglass, right? They traded this, that, that was basically the only time you've seen Star Trek exchange something in the entire 525 hours where they bought something with IP. Science fiction has a big advantage in that many fans, increasingly rich as the baby boomers all move into and beyond their 40s, try consciously or unconsciously to make the science fiction ideas of youth come into being. That's what at least half the people are here for, is to make the ideals as we have as kids become real. Science fiction is a form of self-fulfilling prophecy, or what I call blueprint prophecy, because it not only says what may happen, but also promises if you build it, they will come and they will pay you and think you are cool for making their dreams come true. So there's multiple currencies, there's parallel currencies. One currency is what you make is money. Everybody here can get a job at McDonald's, so it's not about making money, but you would wither and die inside. But your soul grows when you have a vision of something wonderful and you see it, you get a bunch of cool people that you like, you respect, they're smart, they're funny, they're cool, and you make that happen together. That's what it means to me. To, that's the American dream. That's the California dream. Next slide. So science fiction is about stories. I raised 12 million bucks for two ventures. You know what every single person without exception said before writing me a check? That's a great story. You can't, I mean, I'm not saying that this is objective in, information, but I've asked people who raise money. Like I know two guys who raised over $500 million. I know both guys who are the biggest guys in Southern California in getting venture capital. And I said, did that happen to you too? And they said, yep, every single time. So we're talking about thousands of instances of someone writing a check. You don't have a good story, you're not gonna do it. Also, Astro Teller gave a talk to Singularity University about innovation. And I was a little shocked because Astro Teller makes it even more broad. He said, you don't have an innovation if you don't have a good story that goes with it. So, science fiction stories are like Ted, ideas were spreading fanatically. They're real life video karaoke. I highly recommend reading Greg Bear's book, Slant, which talks about how what happens after Hollywood gets wiped out by cheap Indian porn made out of Mumbai. <laughs> and a billionaire advisor friend of mine said, powerful people are always being told things they don't want to hear in ways they don't want to hear it. I tell them things in a way that they like to hear it, whether they like the things or not. So Bar uh, Iran was talking about taking over Bahrain, just like Saddam Hussein was talking about taking over Kuwait. And all the Arabs were in a titter and people were flying around. And he said, basically, I talked about it to the king of Bahrain like this. When the big cat roars, all the little cats run away. And he actually got a sound of a lion and put it on his laptop and played it to make his cat run away to show this. He brought his cat to see the king of Bahrain. To, that's his analogy. I mean, you may not want to hear it, but he's very funny. Okay, next slide. So, more science fiction equals a higher gross domestic product. The cultural equivalent of the geographic mosaic of coevolution, which talks about evolution doesn't just happen with one species and isolation. Yes, we like to pretend that because we, we're ichthyologists, we're entomologists, or mycologists. Anyone know what a mycologist is? Yeah. I don't, well, yes. Um, and, okay. So, but you have multiple species evolving simultaneously as the environment changes. So science fiction creates this new landscape for co-evolution of multiple technologies. Most cultures are nostalgic for the past. The US, UK, Japan, China, Korea, Singapore are nostalgic for the future. No, I, like, there are people, don't you feel like this longing from long ago to build space colonies? I saw it last night. People, you see how many people were referring to Gerard K. O'Neill's things from, what was it, 1977? That's nostalgia for the future. We need a high science fiction output to have high patent product and productivity output, and also co-development with high IQ. I think science fiction makes you smarter along with neurogenesis. Next slide. So, science fiction products, services, and media. Sci-fi channel, sci-fi science, 
That's a Michio Kaku show, Network shows. Nearly all of the top 50 grossing movies, 12 million players of World of Warcraft, lightsabers, costumes, merchandise. I love this thing of a robot Cambrian explosion. Have you seen Robot Magazine? Anyone seen that? Holy shit, that's interesting. That's the most interesting magazine in the world right now. I, um, I was asked, Scott asked me last night who what my favorite talk was. And I realized when I woke up this morning, it was the guy who said, yeah, Honda put 100 million bucks. By the way, that's the real number. 100 million bucks into the IBO. We put 20,000 in and oh, 18,000 went to the, mer the motors. <laughs> You know, so for 2000 we created it. Robots are cool as hell. Droid phones, licensed from Lucas. That's the big competitor now to Apple. It's not a, a, an accident that they chose a science fiction meme because the science fiction people are the innovators and the early adopters, the sneezers, the alpha influencers. Space tourism, well, you guys all know that, so I'm just, I'm, but that's science fiction market. Next slide. Science fiction is a mental Moore's law, doubling packed meaning every 18 months. What decision do we make more than any other? Anyone know? What decision do we make more than any other? No. Sorry? No, nope, not, not eating restroom. Where to direct your gaze? I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at my screen, I'm looking at Robert. Where to direct your gaze? And you direct it towards things that make sense to you. So reading protocols are named for unpacking, like he woke from cryosleep and saw the red lights behind the ship, okay? So instantly a part of your mind might be going, oh, yeah, that's the red ship. Okay, we were just talking about whether a red ship exists or not. Um, so I think science fiction is like a slinky. Over 250 million slinkies have been sold. It's 63 feet of wire compact to three inches. So science fiction words can turn 63 feet of text to the uninitiated, people who don't know it, into three inches, allowing for massive efficiencies. A slinky, once you put on a stairs or a flat surface with a one to four gentle slope, will walk down by redeploying its kinetic energy. Science fiction's packed phrases can also walk a story forward because they imply so much, and like a slinky, they have some packed meetings that don't train so much. So for instance, uh, who knows what Trantor is? Foundation. Foundation. It's the core world of a galaxy, this galaxy, with a trillion, uh, sorry, a quadrillion human beings. But Trantor is Coruscant. Who knows what Coruscant is? It's the capital world of the Star Trek galaxy. By the way, you might find this interesting, and this, and I will reveal, if you didn't know my geek tendencies, Trantor is in the Star Wars Atlas. It's, it's there kind of like an Easter egg to entertain people who read. I've read all the star maps, and there's lots of clues about where George Lucas got his ideas. Next slide. So science fiction preparation leads to power prose. The packed meanings of science fiction words are so phrases that they are to ordinary words as pure uranium-238 at 1,189 pounds per cubic foot is to the 62.4 pounds of cubic foot for water. Science fiction words can explode from the page into the minds of millions of people or into the screen even decades later and still retain all the coiled strength under tension to propel ideas across time and space and complexity. However, there's a cost. Nothing's free. The cost to understand what that 63 feet of text behind each key phrase, and they're probably about, just like, you can understand Japanese if you know about 800 characters. Well, there are probably 800 phrases in science fiction. With them, you have a chance. Without them, it just becomes meaningless babble to you. It doesn't make any sense. It seems stupid. So the cost is that it takes um, years of reading with apprehension and close attention to decode and unpack the phrases instantly and effortlessly. It's easier for some, not this audience, to say, oh, that's science fiction, save you the effort and drop out of the real world that's evolving. Next slide. So the nature of technology, I'm going to skip this because I just want to show that tech with science fiction is technology. That's the takeaway. Next slide. I want to skip the next one. Next slide. Uh, okay. We have a quiet national science fiction learning process. This conference is part of that quiet curriculum of science fiction learning. You go from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence to conscious competence to unconscious competence. This room is filled with people who have unconscious competence about why we need to go to space and how to go to space and everything else. You've forgotten more than most people know about space. So hundreds of millions of people around the world and tens of millions in the US have gone through the long equivalent of, let's say, a five-year apprenticeship 
They're at the stage of unconscious competence with respect to science fiction. That's why we don't see it. We're like fish in the water. Next slide. So, David Harper, I'm going to go to the next slide. Because I'm going to wrap it up. Okay, I want to just talk about this. Architect, Galactus, the physical metamorphosed embodiment of a concept, of a cosmos. There's a book now called Super Gods that basically says that what's coming out of science fiction is going to replace the Abrahamic gods of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And here's a, something from Jack Kirby. My inspirations were the fact I had to make sales. Again, that whole money thing. And I had to come up with characters that were no longer stereotypes. I couldn't depend on gangsters. I had to get something new, so I went to the Bible. I find that very amusing. And I came up with Galactus. And there I was in front of this tremendous figure who I knew very well because I always felt him and couldn't treat him the same way I would any ordinary mortal. And of course, the Silver Surfer is the fallen angel. They were figures never before used in comics. They were above mythic figures, and of course, they were the first gods. Galactus is supposedly the only being from the last universe that existed before, that, it, that has survived into this universe. Next slide. And Galactus is a vision of technology as God. He wields the power of cosmic and employ it to produce any effect he wants, including molecular restructuring, teleportation of even entire galaxies across space or time, time alteration, uh, telekinesis, telepathy, cosmic awareness. And he's even had the ability to create life uh, reconstitute himself and others from complete physical destruction, uh, resurrect the dead, manipulate mortal souls as well as memories, and restore dead planets along with their population. And he destroyed planets for power, and also if you read the Earth X series, it's to control the celestial sea that breaks open and destroys worlds. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking Thanos, this, I highly recommend reading the Infinity Gauntlet series, which talks about how we control time, space, mind, reality, power. Last, next slide. Final thought, I don't want to sound prophetic, but we are about to become gods. Thank you very much. I do have, thank you. I do have one request, and that is that uh, for this white paper, if you think that I missed something, uh, Simone is actually helping with this, but I have a 100-page white paper due, and they want me to include every single influence on government that has come from science fiction. This White House actually is very pro-science fiction, uh, so if you have any stories, because you've worked in aerospace, um, I would love to have, hear them. Um, and my email I can give you, uh, it's alexcto4g at gmail, alexcto4g at gmail.com. Uh, alexcto Thank you.